all start on the outside, the outside looking in. This is where grace begins. Hi guys, this is Shakti from Around the Wicket, where we not only speak about the game, but we try to learn more about the humans behind our sport. And today it gives me great pleasure of having former Australian fast bowler and current specialist coach with the Sydney Sixers, Jeff Francis or Henry Lawson. Uh, Jeff has played 46 test matches for Australia and 79 one-day internationals, taking close to 270 international wickets for, for Australia. He has also coached uh, Pakistan cricket uh, in 2007-2008, and we will find out more about that period. And currently, is a recognised voice with the ABC. Jeff Lawson, thank you so much for joining me on Around the Wicket. Uh, absolute delight to be on Around the Wicket with you, Shakti. Jeff, you were born in Wagga Wagga, a country town in New South Wales. Um, your first cricketer to come from that area. I mean, to, since then, we've had Mark Taylor and Michael Slater, the known ones. Um, tell us about the cricketing landscape in Wagga Wagga. Well, Wagga, you know, for Australia, it's a big, a big country town, so there are lots of sports were played there. And um, Wagga, when I was growing up, was a town of about 40,000 people, which, which once again, for, for Australia, is pretty big in the country. But within about 100 kilometres, there's probably another... 100,000 people. So, you know, there's a lot of people around and, and everyone, everyone played different sports. It's also geographically located. It's actually closer to Melbourne than it is to Sydney. Yeah. But in yeah. winter sports, it's a genuine 50-50 rugby league AFL town. It's virtually where AFL coming from the south meets rugby league coming from the north. So if you grew up there, you played both those sports, which was terrific. You also played a bit of rugby union and Bit of hockey. Michael Slater was a, a state hockey representative. Mark Taylor played uh, schoolboy representative Australian rules, could you believe? Wow. Which is, you know, so everyone played a lot of different sports. But we're, we're very lucky growing up in Wagga. Had, had lots of good facilities, uh, whether that was cricket grounds or, or rugby or hockey or yeah, know, softball. A couple, yeah. a couple of golf courses. Steve Elkington comes from Wagga. Um, nice. Obviously played on the PGA Tour And the weekend was about sport No, no kids ever got into trouble There was no delinquents yeah. because Everyone was playing Which was which was a terrific thing So it was really a uh, you know, really wonderful environment to, to grow up in Academically with, with the teachers that you also played Football or cricket or, or tennis or golf with on the weekend And tell us about your early cricketing days you know, um, And when you received your first baggy green How did that come about? Well, I mean, in the early days we were in Wagga, <laughs> you know, I was playing junior cricket in the morning with, for my school, Wagga Public or Gerwood Street Public as it's called. But then you'd, you'd try and get a game in the afternoon as well. So you'd play your junior cricket nine till 12 and you'd hope someone wouldn't turn up for a third grade game or a fourth grade game. <laughs> and you'd just work around and try and get on the field and, and maybe get the bat number 11 and then just be out there. So, so that, that was the early days. I mean, I always loved playing the game. Uh, then I, I went off to uh, the Big Smoke, went, went to Sydney to study at the University of New South Wales yep. uh, to become an optometrist, which eventually I, I did. And, and becoming an optometrist was also tied up with cricket because my third grade cricket captain in Wagga was also the local optometrist, a guy called Hedley <laughs> Cole. And uh, his son and I went to school together. We were in the same year. He, he was, his son was actually quite a good hockey player. Didn't play much cricket, but uh, Hedley said, well, you know, if you go off and be an optometrist and study, there's always a, a partnership for here back in Wagga. So, you know, cricket's uh, had a big influence that way and, and, and then doing the optometry at the University of New South Wales and, and my first year there, I got into first grade and we won the first grade premiership, which, which is a pretty big deal. And our captain was John Rogers, who played for New South Wales, who's the captain of Chris Rogers, who ended up playing test cricket. Mm. Uh, his brother taught me school and coached me cricket in Wagga. So the, the connection was pretty big. I've got Derek Rogers, who was a, who was a fabulous player. Um, who sadly, when I was away on my first tour in 1979, Derek was killed in a car crash, coming back from representative cricket late on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, so that, that was yeah, tragic. quite sad when I look back on that. But the Rogers brothers had a, a huge impact on, on my cricket. Um, and, and John, being the captain at university, where we won a title, 
when I was only 18 years of age, was was, was pretty important. Um, and in that side, we had Mark Ray, who ended up, he played for New South Wales. He captained Tasmania. He became the, the, the Sydney Morning Herald's chief cricket writer for a number of years. Um, so there, there was a lot of people who had a, a lot of depth in, in the game. There was a huge hiatus in Australia, in world cricket, not just Australian cricket, but when World Series cricket started. So I yeah. was in first university when World Series cricket started. And New South Wales lost about 30 players who went wow. to World Series cricket. Yeah. And probably as a result, I got a game for New South Wales in, in the next season, 1977, 78. And I probably wasn't, wasn't really ready for it. You know, I was just a young kid, you know, pretty raw. Um, but there wasn't too many people left, so they stuck me in the state team. And, and that's where I was from 1977, 78 till uh, mm-hmm. 91, 92 for my, for my last season. In the Australian colours, in the baggy green colours, one of your more memorable series was the 82-83 Ashes, uh, where you performed, you know, really, really well. Um, or leading wicket taker in that series, man of the series as well. This followed, obviously, the 81 Botham series. Um, tell us about that uh, that series, the 82-83 series. And what- well, the 82-83, as you said, it followed the, the Botham series. To, to Australians, it's infamous. To the, the Poms, it's famous. Uh, and I played the first three tests of that series and got some wickets at Lords, which was which was quite nice. But I got injured during the, that that famous Headingley Test match. I I snapped a ligament in my back um, just around wow. tea time on day four. So I couldn't bowl after tea. I, I could hardly stand up to bat on day day five when we were trying to chase that 130 to win. Um, so that that was a momentous day in cricket. So come 82, 83, England have got the Ashes, and it's, it's our job to get them back. And uh, I mean, I I'd, so I started in eighty eighty one in Test cricket. Did that tour to England in in eighty one. Uh, I'd been to Pakistan in eighty, but didn't play. And then again in Pakistan in eighty two, where I played the three Test matches in some pretty tough conditions. So I was learning a lot about the game. I was learning about life, uh, cricket in other countries. I mean, to play in England in seeming wickets and cold weather, and then then go to Pakistan and play in some pretty hot weather. A lot of dry pitches over there, a lot of flat pitches uh, and, and fairly tough living conditions back in the early 80s for, for a touring side. We, we, we didn't have hotels sometimes. We just had mm. guest houses to stay in, uh, which didn't have kitchens. And, you know, so that, that's a part of the adventure. So come 82, 83, uh, I was in pretty good form. I, I was feared I'd got, gotten over a stress fracture early on. Um, I'd learned some new training techniques. You know, I was, I was confident on my own game uh, and uh, got picked for the first test of 82-83 uh, where, you know, Dennis Lilly, um did his knee, couldn't play, and then Terry Alderman, well, infamously chased a spectator who came on the field and, and it hit him over the back of the head and, and did his shoulder. So first test was a draw in Perth uh, and we were Alderman and Lilly down. So all of a sudden, Lawson became the number one bowler, which he really wasn't expecting. Uh, and then the, Jeff Thompson jumped in, Carl Rackerman jumped in, Rodney Hogg jumped in, and uh, we all had a pretty good series. But that, that attack came around pretty much by accident. But look, I guess the fact that, you know, Dennis Lilly was, was the, you know, he was the headline act. He was the experienced bowler. You know, he, he was the great of the game. And it was terrific to have him in the team and learn from him. And uh, very suddenly, those two were out and, you know, responsibility went elsewhere. And, you know, I, I guess I responded to it. It was a series that Australia won 2-1 and you yourself took 34 wickets. Um, you, you stated that you had, in, you know, injury issues uh, previously. You took 180 wickets for Australia, but unfortunately, I, um, you know, you could have taken much more if it wasn't, wasn't for injuries. What do you feel contributed to, you know, you getting injured? And... What do you feel about this current climate where, you know, there's a gym culture, strength and conditioning coaches, you know, how important um, are they and how different are they to what you experienced in your playing days? Yeah, look, like today, what's different today is players get paid to train. You know, when I played in New South Wales or Australia, we only get paid match fees. So mm-hmm. you didn't get put on a contract, so you turned up and, and trained. You had to find the time to go to the gym. And, but there was a good gym culture, even in the early 80s. And Mike Whitney and I used to, you know, run 70 or 80 kilometres a week. We used to be in the gym three wow. times a week. Yeah, we, we used to train pretty hard. 
Um, not just everybody did that. We had to do that in our own time. We had to find time outside of practice and jobs, or for me, going to university. And Mike Whitney had, had jobs to go to um, outside our playing of the game. Um, so these days, people are on contract. So you get paid serious money, full-time money, so you can train 12 months of the year. And you have people who set all your gym programs and supervise you to make sure you do them. And if you get injured, you still get paid. Yep. Whereas if we got injured, we didn't get paid. So, so there's, a, there's a different incentive in the game. Um, having said that, I mean, I, I, I reckon I trained as hard as anybody going around. Um, but, I, you know, I was six foot four, and pretty skinny, and I tried to bowl as fast as I could. You know, I had a bit of hyperextension in my spine early, early on, which doesn't help stress fractures. Well, it helps them. It helps create them. Uh, and I, I didn't have coaches who were looking at me every session. You know, I wish yeah. I did. I, mean, I think we were severely undercoached back in those days. I mean, um, a couple of guys at grade cricket might have a look at you or an ex-player might bump into you and say something. Uh, I, I, there's a story, I, even just last year, Stephen O'Keefe and I were looking at some footage. There was, there was a rainy, there's a rain out in a game and they, they stuck some footage on from um, the 89 Ashes series. And I was bowling at Headingley and uh, I was looking at my run-up. And I, that's the first time I looked at that since 1989. And I wondered, wondered why my rhythm was so bad. It took me 30 years to find out. But of course, I didn't have a coach to tell me. And I really battled through that series to find a great rhythm. I, you know, I bowled okay, but it always felt awkward and it, it was a bit out of kilter. And I had one look at a replay 30 years later and I could see what was going wrong. I said, why am I running out there? It was a stupid angle I was running at, but it just, just happened. Uh, but nowadays, you know, you have a coach who can pull out the video. You can, you can superimpose videos and, and show minor changes in technique and uh, you know, injuries are, are, are addressed straight away. You, you'll have a physio or multiple physios. You have full-time masseurs. You have sports medicine and doctors. So any niggle is looked at straight away. We would play with a niggle um, because... A, we wanted to get paid so we could pay our mortgage. Yeah. Um, and we yeah. didn't want someone else to take our, t our spot in the team. That's what you had to do. So you played with more injuries in those days than they do now. But I think one of the great triumphs of modern contracting and sports medicine is Pat Cummins. Who so at 17 yeah. was asked to bowl 50-odd overs in a, in a Sheffield Shield final and, 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 and broke. And then was thrown into a test match at age 18 and, and broke. And he... We all said this guy is is an absolute talent. You know, he's, he's he may be a talent of a generation. Um, how do we look after him? Well, they gave him a, a full time contract. They paid him a lot of money, but every time he came back, he broke easily. But they had experts to look after him, uh, and he could continue to train. And now, now what have we got? We've, yeah. we've got the best basketball in the world. Oh, I do in, in Pat's. Uh, um, well, he doesn't need a defence, but the fact that he went off and studied during that period and got a business degree as well, I think that that's a big pat on the back for him. But he had the resources and the money through a contract that he could train, recover, and also study. And we didn't have those back in the 80s. They don't really start in the mid-90s, to be honest, when contracts came in. and you, you didn't want to say that you're injured because they'd leave you out of a team and you wouldn't get paid. So there's some different... Uh, so you had to learn... You had to learn how to play with injuries. You do, yeah, you did. And, and, and mind you, fast bowling is a, uh, a skill where you will get injured. Whether, whether it's yeah. sore feet, bad toes, you know, sore back, bad neck, bad shoulder, you'll get all those because you're, you're expressing yourself very, very physically yeah. uh, and you're pushing the envelope all the time. So, yes, injuries are going to come more likely bowling fast and, and bowling off spinners or, or batting. Um, because you're going yep. to stress yourself all the time. That, that's just a part of the territory. And, and even, you know, I, I ended up playing almost 200 first-class games. You know, I played a lot of cricket yep. <laughs> during that period um, and just had a couple of injuries at the wrong time that, that maybe with better, yep. better help, better mm -hmm. expertise and better support because I know when I got injured with my back injury, which, which was a result of bad medical treatment, not, not, not bad training, but bad medical treatment, which I was forced into by Cricket Australia, um, yeah. that if I had been uh, looked after then, um, I would have come back quicker, played more cricket and, and uh, you know, yeah, I mean, 
sure, you, you always like to get more wickets, but yeah, I mean, I would have got 200 and, and more yep. test wickets, but that's just the way it goes. Jeff, from Australia, uh, moving on to, you know, your coaching stint with Pakistan, um, you know, there have been rumours, uh, or there were rumours um, when you departed from the team, uh, you know, to and fro, but from your, uh, you know, from your mark, what was the experience like and why do you feel, you know, your departure came at that time? Well, the experience was was a fabulous one. Absolutely fascinating to be a part of the team, the culture, the, the cricket of Pakistan, the cricket of, of the sub of the subcontinent. I was the last time I was the coach last time India played Pakistan in a Test series. Yeah, That's well, how long ago. And it was yeah. it was wonderful. It, it was in India, three Tests, five one days, and uh, it was. Some of the most exhilarating cricket I've ever been involved with, and that's a that's a tribute to the players of both sides, and also the fans. The Indian fans were just simply wonderful to the Pakistan cricket team. Uh, but yeah, look, I had a great time. Um, I learned a lot about life. I learned a lot about cricket. I, I learned how other people go about their jobs. Uh, you know, I learned more about the politics of cricket, which is always going to happen. But but going to Pakistan, I mean, I went, you know, with my wa- eyes wide open. I only took the job because. They had terrific management at the time. You know, Jeff Kak Nagmi as the as the CEO and uh, uh, Zaki Khan head of operations and Nazim Ashraf the, the the chairman at the time. They were really wonderful people and their their ministry staff, uh, Saban Ahmed and, and these guys um, were really hmm. trying very hard to get Pakistan on a very consistent cricket path, and they're putting a lot of resources into domestic cricket. Uh, and they were treating the players, I thought, with, with a great deal of fairness. Uh, and But they were forced into a certain position of, of picking a very young side after the 2007 World Cup, uh, where, unfortunately, Bob Warmer died and Pakistan performed poorly. And there, was, there were a lot of other rumours going around. But I made it very clear that if there was any any issues, any trouble, I'll just walk away. <laughs> it's, it was pretty straightforward. Hmm. Um, but I, I didn't have any issues until uh, the 2008 general election where there was a change in government and therefore when you have a change in government in Pakistan you have a change at the, the, at the Pakistan Cricket Board because the yeah. PCB answer to a state body they answer a state minister and of course that that minister will change with, with a new prime minister in place um, so it was really the, the result of the national election and, and of course you know uh, uh, Nazim Ashraf got replaced uh, by a guy called Ejaz Bhatt who you know, quite frankly, then embarrassed himself with the ICC and nearly every other cricket authority around the world. And he said, uh, I think the exact quote, uh, Lawson is not for us. So I, it, I hadn't even met him at that stage. Uh, we'd, we'd just lost a pretty close T20 World Cup final. We're a young side getting better. Uh, young players were learning how to, how to play their game. It was quite a really uh, enthralling atmosphere to be a part of. But New new chairman of the board, <laughs> yeah. and he wants somebody else uh, who he's politically affiliated with. So be it. So that so I mean, I'm, I've got no issues with that because I understood that that could happen sooner or yeah. later. I was just very lucky that in my term there, I had uh, the executive and non-executive staff who were, were absolutely terrific. Yeah, you know, yeah. we could sit down, discuss issues, whether I needed, you know, another training camp or more funding or discuss selections or I mean I attended board meetings to give reports and I thought I was given a pretty fair hearing and I, I was pretty straightforward in, with my reports I don't I don't sugarcoat things but it was a really great environment to be, be a part of and and uh, unfortunately um, Pakistan national politics gets in the way so so, so be it. Um, I guess one of the you know more controversial parts um, you may have met in Pakistan was, you know, when you had to give a review uh, or a character reference for Salman, um, the disgraced Pakistan cricketer, due to the, you know, the infamous incident uh, in England. Um, do you still feel that, you know, you gave a fair reference and, you know, bias aside, I guess, uh, you know, your experience with Salman was was favourable? Yeah, I mean, I mean, when people ask for references and I've given... A number to a lot of people over the years. Oh, my reference is based on my knowledge of what people do. And, yeah. and yes, of course, I was very disappointed uh, that, that Salman had been involved in uh, the spot fixing. Um, and Amir was a part of that. I mean, he was just a young guy 
coming through the ranks when I was there. I'd met him, and he was just a lovely, natural person and cricketer. But, but like, they come under a whole lot of different stresses. People don't understand the kind of stress that these guys are put yep. under. Um, but I mean, I gave a reference um, that reflected my personal interactions with Salman Butt, and and I. I think one of the, the biggest disappointing things, I, mean, I found him a very intelligent guy, very articulate, uh, incredibly hardworking, loved the game, loved playing for Pakistan. He had all those attributes and he could have been a, a great of the game because he was a, a wonderful opening batsman and he really wanted to work hard in his game. So I couldn't fault any of those things. And, and the great disappointment comes when people who, who you see as natural leaders get led astray. And that happens in all walks of life. Yep. You know, I mean, um, unfortunately, that was in, in cricket. Um, it, um, he spent time in, in jail, which is a fair punishment for uh, for bowling a no ball or telling someone to bowl a no ball, considering what some people get in life. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think the punishment was a little bit unfair for all those involved. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't think it reflected um, the severity of the issue, but it did send a message to everybody, everybody yep. involved in the game, yeah. that if you do this, you could spend time behind bars. So from that point of view, it, it, it uh, in a harsh, but maybe yes, you know, a very indicative penalty. Yep. And Jeff, one of the things that you mentioned, or one of the words that you mentioned was consistency. Uh, when it comes to Pakistan, they seem to have a lot of talent, a lot of young cricketers coming through the system that have a lot of ability. Uh, unfortunately, they, cannot seem to put consistent performance and could be down to, you know, that them not getting much experience nowadays as well of, of playing a lot of cricket. Um, also, the coaches keep, you know, changing um, due to poor performances by the team. Um, what do you put it down to? What do you put it down to in terms of their inconsistent um, showings? Well, well, the, the matter of consistency, that was the one thing. Well, what was the, not the one thing, it was the main thing that I was going to con- uh, concentrate on with this team. Yeah. Um, so we have a have a consistent selection policy. So everybody knew what it was. Uh, good performance is rewarded. Uh, if you were failing, we had to find out why. Should we persist with the player, but not chop and change? You know, every second game because you've lost a match. Yeah. And you got to lose matches. Yeah. There, there's some pretty good sides out there around the world. And we, you know, my view was we need to be consistent, particularly. At the end of 07, where they'd uh, they'd moved on a lot of those older players after the 07 World Cup, so we had a very young team. So this is the time to identify the talent and stick with them. Um, yeah, you've, you've got to make judgments on on people, and they, they can be quite subjective. But try to make them based on their performances and also their potential. With a young captain, well, well, young, very very young captain, very young vice captain, just a couple of experienced players, we had to be consistent. In our selections, and I, I tried to make that point to my chairman of selectors a number of times, and I think we we started to do that, and and that's one of the, the more disappointing things about moving on before my two years was up, because after two years I would then decide whether I'd do another yeah. session. That that we were actually building towards that consistency, and the great thing I saw was how well we did in that that 2007 T20 World Cup. Because I, I told the guys, not, not to worry, just go and play, enjoy. You're all talented. Um, don't worry about selections. Don't you know? Just mm. try and enjoy mm. what you do. Now, that's easily said than done, to be honest. Uh, but but um, I tried to keep the selectors well away from them. Um, didn't want the selectors talking to them. Uh, didn't want them putting any pressure on them. And, and fortunately, we went off to, I think we went off to Kenya for a little tournament. Then we went on to... South Africa. So we're out of, out of the country for a fair while. And when it got to the pressure games in the T20 World Cup, our guys played wonderfully well. Yeah, we, we went within one hit of winning the T20 World Cup yeah. when nobody yeah. gave us a yeah. chance with a really, really young side. Um, except that we brought Misbah back, uh, which, which was absolutely terrific. Um, so he, he did wonderfully well, Misbah. When he, when he yeah. was the veteran yeah. that, that then was the glue in the side and I you know, just just became a, a wonderful captain of Pakistan. From Pakistan, you've coached, um, you know, in the IPL uh, with the Kochi Tuskers um, in the in the only year that they were there. Um, you had some wonderful players uh, in that team: Mahela Jawadina, Brendan McCallum, uh, Ravindra Jadeja, Murli, uh, just to name some. Um, how was that experience in the IPL? Well, it was fascinating, but 
different fascinating to being in Pakistan. <laughs> it is a circus, isn't it? Um, the difference we had at Kochi was it was the first time for the team in the in the competition, and and the owners weren't really cricket people. They, they were business people. They were a little bit different than the normal Indian business person. They weren't just besotted with cricket. They actually wanted to make it run as a business. And they wanted to have a lot of say in what went on with the cricket. And that got a little bit out of hand. Mm. But it also meant they had many, many things to do to make the franchise work properly. It's not just about the team. You know, it's all right. I, I'll get, I could go to an auction and pick a team. As you said, we had some wonderful players there. Uh, we, we, went, we went spin heavy because we thought we'd have a, a turning wicket down there in Kochi. Uh, yeah. We didn't. You know, it was a ground that hadn't been used for cricket for quite some time. It was a wonderful stadium, uh, but the, the wicket was a bit quick and bouncy to start off with. And then we had a couple that were something they didn't bounce, but it didn't spin very much. Uh, but the, the groundsman there was was trying to get the wicket done. And, uh, you know, they're dealing with, with sponsors and crowds and ticketing. And, it, you know, it was, it was a massive undertaking to get yeah. the Kochi Tuskers up and running. Now, once again, the, the biggest disappointment is that it only went for one year. So the, the franchise had to do some things that the, the, the BCCI wanted them to do. Uh, yep. but, but, you know, you can imagine that after, you know, three, four, five years of getting that under control, I think it would have been a, a really powerful franchise. The players love playing there because Kochi was such a wonderful city. Yep. You know, down yep. there on the, the southwest coast, uh, down in Kerala, that, that's a wonderful part of India. And quite different from any other parts of India. And the players really enjoyed being down there. And we were getting used to our practice facilities and our travel and, and all the little things that the players, you know, worry about. Um, so as a first year, it was pretty much a success, um, a qualified success. Yeah. And it would have only yeah. got better, unfortunately. The BCCI and the owners had their differences. And the coaching Tuskers were, were just a one-year team. You also got to coach Sri um, You know, he's had his troubles outside of um, or off the pitch, but um, he's trying to make his way back into playing uh, some some domestic cricket. Um, how was Sri to handle when you were coach? And you know, what was his work ethic like? Well, Sri is one of those guys that, that from the outside he gets a bad rap. I just mm. loved dealing with him. He was incredibly enthusiastic. Um, Training wise, he worked as hard as anybody. Yep. You know, he was, he was a very hard trainer, very hard practicer. And, of course, he comes from Kerala. You know, he's only one of, I think, two test cricketers ever come from Kerala. Um, so he was a local hero. So he had a lot of pressure on him to do well. And the fans just absolutely adored him. But I found him really easy to work with. Yep. Um, he, he, would, he would think outside the square. We had some great conversations about cricket that – your standard player doesn't have about how to approach matches and players and training and, and the politics of, of, um, of cricket and the polit- and politics of life. And he went into politics in, in Kerala. Uh, I found him a very intelligent guy. Um, and uh, I mean, he's a bit quirky, but you yeah. get that. A couple of games, he bowled absolute rockets. You know, it, it was 150 on the radar. Um, and that was playing at home. You want to impress the home fan. He bowled super fast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, like for the coaching Tuskers that year, he was he was a big plus. Uh, he did everything I asked of him and, and more. Um, he helped out the other team guys around around Kochi when they wanted to get used to the local area. Very much a team player. So so when he gets a bad rap, I I don't quite understand because I've, I've seen a very good side of him. Excellent, Jeff. And with the Sixers, um, you're a specialist coach with them now. Um, you know, what made the difference last uh, summer when they won the BBL uh, against the Melbourne Stars and obviously had a good season? Uh, we had Greg Shepard uh, about a month ago um, telling us about, you know, why the Sixers succeeded. But in your opinion, what made them, um, you know, perform that well? Well, if you had Greg Shepard on, it was probably too modest to say that one of the main <laughs> reasons they said it was because of Greg Shepard. Because he's he is the most he experienced is. coach in Australia. Yeah, he's the most winningest coach in Australia. Um, obviously, a long experience at Delhi as well through the early days yep. of the IPL. I mean, I coached that year. I was with with uh, the the Tuskers. I coached the game against Greek uh, at the uh, at the Feroz uh, Kotla, Kotla um, yeah. which was which was terrific. But uh, I've got to know him, know him a lot more since then. Since he's become involved with the Sixers over the last well six or seven years, really. Um, and, and 
he is a very well prepared coach. He do he takes the players as individuals. And there's a lot of coaches around, particularly younger coaches, who just say they think there's a, a formula how you deal with everybody, and there's not. You've got to deal with everybody individually. And Greg gets to know what works best for all the individuals. Mm. You know, whether it's Moses Enriquez, whether it's Tom Curran, whether it's Steve O'Keefe, Greg works very hard I mean, at, at finding out everything that needs to be done. And then at, at game time, um, he lets the players do their thing. He understands yeah. that the captain is in charge of, of game time. You know, and having good captains really does help. And having great captains, Moses Enriquez is, is, is a super captain. Uh, smart guy, very good cricketer, uh, but understands T20 in particular very well. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. and the, the win was about, you know, everyone performing at the right time. You know, as I whether it was, you know, Tommy Curran was terrific. James Vince was terrific. Uh, Steve O'Keefe, the spinners did a great job. Nathan Lyon continues to show that he can play all forms of the game. Which yep. Is, yep. Which is, fixers are always happy to have him. And also, New South Wales are always happy to have him, whether it's white ball or red ball cricket. But he is just a phenomenal Nathan Lyon. And he loves putting on the magenta and playing for the Sixers. Josh Hazelwood came in late and, and bowled superbly. Uh, you know, it was, it was a terrific all-round performance. You know, T20, you, know, you need to play well and you need a bit of luck. Uh, I think the Sixers had, you know, a few things just went your right way at the right time. But I think they really did deserve... To, to win the title in in the end, um, yep. it was it was the result of I think a, you know, also four or five years of hard work, you know, you know Sean Abbott developing as as an outstanding T20 bowler, and having that sort of attack that could to really, you know, limit sides in their scores, and then uh, you know we didn't have to chase big scores too often, uh, a couple of times we did we, we we got them so yeah team performance you know pat on the back for Greg Shipper well prepared by the best coaches in the world. Yep. And one thing you mentioned, actually, that cut off was uh, that the selectors don't have confidence in Nathan Lyon in the, you know, in the shorter form, um, but his record tells otherwise. Um, Jeff, you are an advocate for gender equality in sports, um, you know, with the fair break global movement. Um, can you share some um, insights onto that movement and, you know, the wonderful work Sean, um, Sean Martin has been doing as well with, with the group? Yeah, I mean, Sean Martin, you know, has been working very hard. Cool. I don't know how many years it's been. It's been a lot. <laughs> he, he never mm. gives in. You know, initially with Lisa Stalaker, he saw what a bad deal she was getting. Uh, fortunately, since those days, uh, the lot of women's cricketers has improved a great deal. The WBBL has been a, been a part of that. Uh, let's hope through the, through the COVID uh, interruption that, uh, you know, women's sports seems to be taking a hit in general. And let's say the, yep. the WBBL mm-hmm. schedule to go ahead. We're not sure what's going to happen with our overseas players at the moment. But uh, it's interesting times that we live in, so we're just going to play that one by ear. But but Fair Break has, has been working hard for a number of years and to, to try and give our, not just our women cricketers, but, but people involved in cricket more opportunities. So it's, you know, we've had players from Botswana and... Uh, uh, Botswana. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, even for our game at Bradman Oval uh, earlier on in the year, we flew in a young young girl from... South Carolina, or North or South Carolina, one well, of the Carolinas, um, 15 years of Indian descent. Her parents, I think, originally came from Hyderabad. She was a 15 years old, and she could play. She was a seriously good player, and she came over and, and joined in all these other uh, great players, like Alex Blackwell and San Amir, and these sort of you know, world-ranked players. And that was just wonderful to see. So the intention was this year was to, to be in the States uh, having a look yeah. at more players. But, of course, you know, all those plans are on hold at the moment with, with lack of travel. I think we'll still try and get our games together, whatever hubs we can find around the Pacific. Uh, but, Shakti, don't ask me what's going to happen next week or the week after because nobody knows at the moment. <laughs> uh, two, weeks, two or three weeks ago, there was no COVID in Sydney, very little in Melbourne, and we are all pretty happy, and now it's changed. So, um, in three, four, five weeks, two, three, four months, we're not too sure, but... But fair break will will continue to, to champions champion women's cricket, yeah. Uh, but also mm-hmm. women's, uh, opportun- gaining opportunities uh, through their sport um, as long as we can. I mean, look, I'm really really proud to be a, be a part of that. Um, uh, as Sean and, and I would both say, we, we don't want these old white blokes looking after. We're, we're trying to hand out the reins over to all the young women, and, and there's plenty of there who are pretty keen too. So um, uh, the future is is bright, but it. The curtain hanging over at the moment 
as it over everybody is, is what COVID is doing. But if yep. if that can get cleared away, there'll be more games. Um, we'll have more more ladies from around the world, whether, whether that's from China, certainly Hong Kong. Uh, our player from Botswana uh, was was absolutely strangely good. Yep. When you mention you know cricket, women's cricket in Botswana, people just shake their heads, but. Now, I went to Rwanda last year uh, to sort of see some couple of very good players there. Um, Rwanda is a is a is a fascinating country in itself with all the troubles it's had in the past, but it's in great shape now. And and cricket, both male and female, is 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 one of their great community sports. Um, yeah. So lots of opportunities out there. We've just got to go and find them. Hopefully, we'll have that opportunity. You know, if if we get international travel back, but uh, we've yep. all got to, our fingers crossed about where that's headed. Yep, Fairbreak's doing a wonderful job and, you know, if anyone wants to get in touch, um, you know, you can always contact me and I can pass you on to Sean's um, contact. Um, I wanted to ask you, T20 World Cup has been postponed. What's your opinion on that? Um, do you feel it's the right decision taken, uh, especially with the IPL also happening uh, towards the end of the year? Speaking of something, you know, we, we live here in Australia, we're in the middle of what we see COVID as, and I, I don't think they had any options. But to bring in... Um, how many teams were there? They were having 16 teams. Yep. The, yeah, 16 so to bring, in, to bring in so many and trying to find, you know, quarantine hubs for them and, and if they had to have two weeks quarantine, which I expect they would have had to because the Australian government's been quite strong on that. Yep. And then find the venues and the games, I think it would have been just too hard. So yep. putting it off, fine. The, the IPL is never going to be put off. Uh, now, how they run that, I'll be fascinated. Because I've got some friends in India um, who were tucked away and quarantined and not let out. So uh, how the IPL is going to work, I'm not too sure. I'm, I'm going to be fascinated. Will the overseas players want to turn up in India um, to play? Well, yeah. it'll be yeah. money, money versus virus, won't it? So, I think it's moved, it's moved to Dubai, isn't it? So, yeah, in the UAE. So that will be interesting as well. Oh, if they just move it all there, well, once again, easier to control. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the, it's, I guess it's a bit, if they do that, it's a bit like what they've done for the football codes here. You move them all out yeah. of Victoria. You try to put them in the safe places. Um, and you've just got to play as many games as you can because people will watch it on two. People want to watch it. It's very important. It's much easier to uh, to run that in in the UAE. You do, yeah. you know, you do Sharjah, um, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, I guess. You, at least you've got three grounds and you do what you can. Yep, let's go. Let's go for eight rapid-fire questions. Actually, nine rapid-fire questions. Who was the cricketer you looked up to when you were growing up? Uh, Dennis Lilly. In the backyard, and I ran past the clothesline and bowled my brother. I was definitely Dennis Lilly. Question number two. Who was the toughest batsman you have ever bowled to? Oh, a lot of tough batsmen. Uh, bowling to, to Javid in Pakistan doesn't come much tougher than that. Bowling to Viv Richards anywhere doesn't come much tougher <laughs> than that. Uh, yeah, I'd say, I'd say Javid in Pakistan, number one. Viv anywhere else, number two. Question number three. Who was the most annoying teammate of yours? That is uh, the easiest question I've, I've had in my life. It's Greg Matthews. <laughs> He's the most annoying player of all time. And I did, yeah. He's Matthews, yeah. A lot of time in dressing rooms with Greg. Mind you, he could play. He was he was yeah. uh, a, a great player. Um, this question, I guess it's um, of the current lot. The four batsmen that are named in the Fab Four, Virat Kohli, Steve Smith, Kane Williamson or Babar Azam. Who's your pick um, in terms of who you like to watch or who you think is a better batsman? Well, I think Steve Smith's the better batsman, but watching him is... You know, fascinating. You need to <laughs> need to tie yourself down to your chair. I mean, yeah. I, I I started laughing when I watched Smithy bat. You know, when he's doing his mannerisms, it just it just I can't be serious. And then he'll if I was bowling to him, I wouldn't know what to do. I, I yeah. would have to turn away straight. I couldn't watch him. I just <laughs> have to focus on bowling the ball because you you need to do that. Um, yeah, Coley. I, I love watching Coley. Babar Azam's getting there. Um, yeah. As you know, I, I still love watching Pakistan play and do well. And Babar Azam is is go, only going to get better and better. And uh, Williamson just keeps holding New Zealand together. So four terrific players. Yeah. Um, 
Smith at present in great form. Yep, of, of the four you'll pick Steve Smith for now. Uh, question number five, of the current fast bowlers, who impresses you the most? Uh, there's a lot. Um, the Kiwis have got some terrific bowlers. Uh, Lockie Ferguson, I love him. You know, yeah. he can stay on the park. He, he bowls sharp. He was great for them in the World Cup and, and bowling fast with a terrific slow ball. Mitchell Stark when he's on song, but Pat Cummins, number one. Um, and uh, India, of course, uh, with uh, their man with a straight arm. Boomerang, Shami. Yeah, I mean, Boomer, um and uh, oh, like, like Shami's a real pro, um, but uh, Boomer is exciting because he's so explosive. I mean, how can you bowl 145 by five steps? Yeah, yeah. And not not really get injured. That is that is outstanding stuff. So I love it when Jasper's running in and bowling some in-swing Yorkers. Like, Your most favourite bowling performance? Most favourite? Well, I reckon it might have been. Uh, Old Trafford, 1989. I got six in the first innings because that was a, a, the, the test match that decided the Ashes. Mm. And Australia got the Ashes back and re regained for the first time on English soil for 55 years. And I got six in the first dig. I got three, might have got three in the second. Got, I think it was man of the match. So I reckon six for whatever it was. I can't remember the number. Um, six for an Old Trafford in 1989 in a test match that got the Ashes back. Question eight. What do you feel the women's game has that the men's game doesn't? That is a very, very interesting question. It's got lots of things. Um, it, it's got uh, a great competitive spirit, but it doesn't seem to have the, uh, the divisive edge that the men's game can have, yeah. which is a terrific thing. I mean, they play hard. They're very competitive ladies, uh, very skillful. Um, I think the modern cricket bat suits women's cricket. Uh, the modern cricket bat needs to be curtailed in men's cricket, but it suits women's cricket. You know, they can now hit cover, uh, extra cover drives for six. Mm. You know, that, that's a terrific thing. If you're good enough, um, if you can bowl straight enough, you get rewarded. So there's a lot of skills happening in women's cricket, but I reckon the, the difference is is the competition. It's, it's almost a pure style of competition. And, yep. You know, you, you occasionally they'll see them have a word, but generally they're smiling and laughing and you know, they drop a catch, they're disappointed, uh, but you, you don't see any negative reactions from them. They tend to get on with it. Yeah. Uh, Melissa Healy's a classic. Who's, who's a terrific wicketkeeper. She's got wonderful hands and occasionally she'll make a blue uh, and she'll, you know, she doesn't mope around and get sulky about it. She just has a bit of a laugh and has a bit of a laugh with the teammates and gets on with it. I think that's, that's a great view to have of your cricket. And the last question, Jeff, is what is one rule that's, that needs to change in cricket? Uh, one rule is the leg side wide. Absolute nonsense. Um, balls that are missing legs. I'm talking about white ball cricket, of course. Balls yep, that miss legs <laughs> by a millimetre get called a wide. Who thought, you know, batsmen play bad shots and miss the ball and it gets called a wide. They need to review that. Because I find every time I watch a game, it really annoys me. <laughs> a lot of lot of rules are changed for the bowlers, that's for sure. Uh, but yeah. that that one in particular, uh, it's easily fixed, and I do not understand. In fact, when I was coaching Pakistan, I tried to find out from the ICC why they were doing that, and nobody could tell me why. It's if the umpires had just decided to do it, uh, and that was going to be the rule. Whereas, there, effectively, it's not the rule. They don't. I'll read the rules assiduously every year, and that's not a rule, but th that's what they call it. We can save ourselves time and effort to make the game fairer through a very simple move. Awesome, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining me today um, on Around the Wicket and sharing your wonderful memories with your Australian team, You know your coaching experiences, obviously, um, you know, where the game is heading, uh, especially with female cricket. All the best with Fair Break. Um, hopefully, we can see more development of cricket in Associate Nations. Especially. Hey, thanks, thanks, Acti. Same to you. Everyone who's tuned in and is going to watch, make sure you stay safe. And everyone, do the right thing, please. A mask, clean your hands. Keep apart. We'll be awesome. a lot better off. <laughs>